My name is Gracie Wallach. This morning I woke up and laid in bed for about an hour, scrolling through Facebook, watching Shark Tank, and looking over this speech. Same morning routine as a lot of kids in the New Trier Township. Then I went upstairs and poured myself a bowl of cereal and scrolled through my Instagram feed. I came across a picture posted by Banksy, famous social justice street artist. This picture was a young, seemingly African boy walking through a desert with a bucket of water, wearing a distressed shirt that read, I hate Mondays. This picture was captioned, be thankful for what you have. When people tell me to be grateful, I get annoyed. I'm grateful every day, but I can't always be comparing my life to that of an African child. Just because there's food on my table doesn't mean that I don't have problems too. And I'm right. But maybe seven times a year do I actually look at myself and realize that I come from an upper middle class home. I attend a prestigious high school, I have two healthy parents, and I am a heterosexual white Jewish teenager. Maybe it's because at a high school like New Trier, there isn't a lot of obvious economic or racial diversity, but I rarely feel uncomfortable speaking my mind, and I confidently know that perceptions and impressions that other students and teachers have of me will be based solely on my actions. Unfortunately, what seems fundamental for me isn't necessarily the case for everyone, specifically for people of color. As Melody Hobson, chairman of DreamWorks Animation and president of Ariel Investments, has experienced firsthand. As a single black woman and graduate from Princeton University, her net worth is over $5 million. Yet, en route to one of her own recent speaking events, she was scolded for being late and asked, where is your uniform? This is not the 1960s, and this speech is not another racism is bad assertion. I think we can all agree on that by now. But Melody's story isn't a singular or even rare occurrence in 2014. So we must ask ourselves, with the civil rights movement 50 years in the rearview mirror, why have we not been able to achieve racial equality? My purpose today is to set, shed some light on that question, starting with the question itself. We must first understand why racial equality cannot be the end goal. Second, discover the real factors of racial inequality before finding, finally finding out ways that we can use white privilege for good. As a high school junior, the saying fair isn't always equal is not unfamiliar to me. So why hasn't such an infiltrated and institutionalized mantra not translated to our fight against racism? This simple and somewhat cliche adage perfectly demonstrates why we cannot strive for racial equality, but rather should reach for racial equity. Equality means the same in number, quality, rank, or degree, and equity means the same or being fair in justice and the way people are treated. The difference here is that one is equal in terms of number and rights and the other is fair. Here we have a picture showing on the left something that is equal. All three people have the same amount of opportunity as their stands are the same height. However, equity gives them all a fair way to see the baseball game in the picture. This is an important aspect of ending racism because whether, even if the playing field is leveled, it might not always be fair. The idea is that we have to not acknowledge that there is an inherent disadvantage for minorities living in the majority's world and make up for that disadvantage. We've been trying to reach equality for over 50 years, and the reason it hasn't worked is because we haven't addressed or even acknowledged the disadvantage of being non-dominant. And again, that's not completely our fault. The dominant or white people have the luxury of not thinking about racial disparities because it is not a part of our lives. Still having a hard time understanding how race is always in the forefront for people of color? Let's instead consider left-handed people. Pretty much wherever lefties go, they are reminded of their non-dominance. Take for example in this building. Most classrooms have chairs with built-in desks that are made for right-handed people. It never crosses my mind, being a right-handed person, that these desks are made for right-handed people. However, a left-handed person notices the discomfort every time they sit in one of these desks. They notice it every time they pick up scissors, sports equipment, or even a guitar. Being left-handed is and has to be a pre-thought to almost every action because they undoubtedly will face a discriminant obstacle in daily life. Apply this idea to people of color. When I travel with my family, I don't have to worry about weary glances or extra and unnecessary searches in the security checkpoint but that anxiety is carried by my friends of color. They fear being patted down, being singled out, and being given weird looks by other travelers. Whereas I don't worry about those things because when I go to an airport, it is a rare occurrence for me. 
But how does this story of a Middle Eastern man in a security line illustrate white privilege? Because we don't have to worry about it. We don't feel judgmental stares or breaches of privacy when having all of our bags rifled through or our bodies patted down. We must understand the problems behind the things that we don't think about, and we must be conscious of things that we normally don't notice and understand our advantages in being the dominant culture. Now that we have a better understanding of what our goal should be and how being the dominant culture has inherent privileges, it's time to debunk a few myths. A lot of people believe that the disparities that exist today between whites and people of color are because of other factors, such as socioeconomic status. It's true that there are more affluent white people than non-whites, but to demonstrate how social class is not a main factor in the cycle of inequity, we can look at this chart. Whites in every income bracket outscore their peers of color. However, more alarming is that the richest black students still perform lower than the poorest white students which tells us that while a higher income can benefit all races, it does not close or even attempt to close the racial achievement gap. By now, I hope that I have convinced you that white privilege is real and that throwing money at the problem won't work. Luckily, I believe that a few very simple solutions can get us on the path to racial equity. Benjamin Franklin framed it best by saying, justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. We, as the dominant white culture, have to stop pretending like racism doesn't exist and become, as our dear friend Melody suggests, color brave and not color blind. Because it's the blindness, the lack of acknowledgement that has perpetuated this problem for so long. We need to first talk about race, second, educate ourselves, and finally, we need to become anti-racists. So what can I do being a white person? I can never understand. I can only put myself in a person of color's shoes so much. However, being a white person, I have a louder voice, and I should use that to the advantage of others, no matter what their race or ethnicity. I first must understand and acknowledge my privilege as a white person, and then I must open up a dialogue and a conversation about race. Race is not a taboo topic, and it is a topic just like everything else that should be brought to light. The issue now that schools are facing is that race is becoming systemic and institutionalized because it is not believed to be an issue. Racism is still considered a touchy subject. It is still something that we teach during the unit of the civil rights movement, and at the end of the unit, we teach that racism was then solved and eliminated. Acknowledging and telling the truth about racism as a white person is vital to ending racism as a whole. And understand that racism isn't just work hard and you can get out of it. Recognize that the current education system and curriculum is created by the dominant culture. To promote a more diverse learning community, educational institutions must promote learning with a broader lens. Social history exists. Ever heard of Rosa Parks and the famous movement starting bus boycotts? Well, Rosa Parks wasn't exactly a visionary. Don't get me wrong, Rosa Parks was an amazing leader, influence, and activist. However, there were many like her, many who participated in the movement before her, that were not brought to light. Rosa Parks was chosen by historians as the face of the Montgomery bus boycotts because she was a married, educated, Christian woman, not fulfilling many negative stereotypes of people of color. This is just one way that white people in power manipulate history to make it seem as though racism has been eliminated. It shows one vantage point instead of many, and it is crucial to examine different perspectives surrounding major events in history. We cannot limit the viewpoints of these stories to one side or one person, which has shown time and time again to favor whites and neglect or disfavor minorities. It is our responsibility as young people and leaders of our generation to demand these things from our schools. We must call for multi-perspective historical teaching to create a more well-rounded and overall more globally educated learning experience. That is also progressive in terms of ending racism. Even minorities in good, well-funded, usually predominantly white schools can feel out of place because of their race. Every day they must walk through these halls and through their own neighborhoods and feel judged because of the negative connotations caused by the color of their skin. This is a prime example of the importance of equity rather than equality. Blacks and whites in these schools have the same opportunities, but they are not treated the same from the start. And therefore, before they can even begin to learn, if they are too different from the crowd, they will be isolated and excluded. From this stereotype, 
growth becomes more difficult, as it is shown in an appalling statistic. Among whites who start below the poverty line when they are born, 23% stay below the poverty line when they reach age 40. Among blacks, however, 51% stay below the poverty line. So here I am ranting about the seemingly obvious aspects of white privilege. White people get more stuff more easily just because they're white. And if there is one thing I have learned in my measly 16 years and 362 days on this earth, it is that, as James Baldwin, acclaimed African-American writer and social critic would say, nothing can be changed until it is faced. Acknowledging that racism exists and acknowledging that white privilege is real and is a factor in the lives of minorities and majorities alike is imperative. It is important to speak up. If we have a voice that is actively heard, we must use it to speak for those whose voices are silenced. We must educate about racism and achievement gaps in schools across the nation and the world. We have to institutionalize anti-racism. The act of being actively against racism instead of just not being racist. Passivity in racism is not effective. One must speak up and speak out about the issue and be actively opposed to it rather than just passively against it. It is somehow a belief that anti-racist is being anti-white which is blatantly and quite obviously not the case. Being anti-racist is being pro-racial expression of all races, and most importantly, pro-racial equity. It isn't helping anyone that racism is seen as a touchy subject or a taboo topic. And it definitely isn't helping anyone to believe that racism does not exist. Make it known that it is not the fact that people of color have a higher poverty rate and lower socioeconomic status that limits them from the equitable opportunities as white people. We have to work to eliminate institutionalized racism to end this achievement gap. Money doesn't help that much. Help them understand the difference between equality and equity, the difference between equal and fair. Lastly, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Know that your discomfort is something that many people of color have to face daily. Know that often these discussions can become hard to talk about, but that doesn't mean that they should not be discussed. Know that at times, other voices are more important to be heard than your own. Take a step back and allow personal emotions and empathy to lead the discussion. Be empathetic for people of color and don't be afraid to put yourself in their shoes in many different situations. Understand the inequities and be active in fixing them. Be aware, be outraged, and encourage others to be too. Thank you. <laughs>